Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and our goal here at We Are Libertarians is to help you sound smarter while talking politics with your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. We toss out the screaming heads and put people before political parties and give context to the news to make you think. I'm Chris Spangle, and this is a special series on We Are Libertarians called The Swamp Explained. And my co-host on this venture is Rob Cortell, a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C. Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate. And given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob always gives us a great insight into the swamp that makes up our na nation's capital. We do have a standalone feed if you want to go back and listen to some of the past episodes, how we, how we managed to weirdly meet one day and his <laughs> past work with people like George H.W. Bush. It's very interesting and uh, uh, always great to talk to you, Rob. It's uh, been a little too long. We, we, we always shoot for every two weeks. But we, I think we've, I'm just paid about every talking. two months. Yes. <laughs> and every time we, I go, yeah. well, well, what should we talk about? There's no news. And there's always, as a joke, uh, there's a million different things going on. Yep. Well, and today I'm coming to you from the uh, swamp itself. Are you in D.C.? I am. Yeah, I'm in, in my little pied-a-terre in uh, the Navy Yard. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so now you, you do what when you're, you do all kinds of different business when you're in DC, cause normally you're now kind of, I don't want to say you're retired because you're a very busy person. Um, it, what, what would you say your life is kind of like, you bounce between these different places and you do work. And yeah. You, like, what do you, what are you in DC for like now? today? Right. Uh, well, that's a good question. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've been involved with uh, trying to get started is the idea of maritime innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I work with a lot of startups and, and uh, serve on various technology boards and all that. And, uh, and one of the things I've been interested in for some time is how you bring innovation, innovation and new technologies to the maritime industry. And so um, it, it turns out it's one, it's a new area for venture capitalists. They, I think they run out of other areas. So it's what you call a vertical. <laughs> Time to <laughs> so, ruin another industry. Yeah, is what that is right. That's right. So, yeah. you know, well, it's, it's very interesting. And there's some really interesting um, big players starting to look at this. Uh, one of the most interesting is a group called Mass Challenge. Uh, and they, uh, they're out of Boston. They, they have, I think, seven or eight or nine different um, city verticals. Um, one of the companies that uh, I've been advising, for example, is a company that has a way to lay fiber, uh, cable fiber and optical fiber directly on a hard surface. So that's really important potentially if you want to uh, get broadband out to parts of the country that aren't served. And you know about literally probably about 70% of the physical area of the United States and, and certainly in Virginia where I spend most of my time um, is not served by either cell phone or, um, or, or uh, uh, high-speed broadband. And that's a big deal. You know, it's a big deal for two of the key potential constituencies, one of which is the elderly who could benefit from all of this new um, uh, medical technology. So, for example, uh, earlier this year, I, I met a guy who was wearing a ring that um, measures his blood pressure, his temperature, his heartbeat. Oh, wow. and, and of course, as it goes along, these things will be able to do more and more things. And it relies on uh, um, having high-speed broadband. And so think about that. You're an elderly patient. You could be monitored from a thousand miles away or, yeah. or down the street. And, um, and so there's both real-time monitoring and then there's predictive monitoring and all the data of your history and everything. And you say, well, if it hits this, it's going to do that. And, right. and if you don't have broadband, um, you can't get it. And one of the least served groups, underserved groups is the elderly. And then the flip side of that is um, uh, young, the young people and students. And so uh, in the county that, in which I live, about 35% of the students are not served. The Commonwealth of Virginia is, is putting about 20 million into that annually uh, to try to help people do deals with the cable companies to extend broadband. But the, honestly, the cable companies are reticent. And 
And this is a 10 year plan. So think about it. Kids are in school for 12 years and mm -hmm. if it takes 10 years, you're going to miss almost a whole generation of kids in this particular County, a third of the kids. So, and all of the data shows that they're substantially disadvantaged in other uh, opportunities and they, they're not as facile with internet as their peers. Now they, they get it at school, but who wants to go to school and live there? You know, in the middle of the night, they can't. And they, and they ban know. all the good websites. So yeah, and they ban all the good websites, right? <laughs> yeah, they ban all the porn. <laughs> hey, so anyway, <laughs> right. So, but the point is, so anyway, so you know, um, uh, so this company is called Traxel. Actually, just one one of these mass challenge opportunities out in um, Austin, which is a very different vertical than, let's say, the one in Boston. And they got $150,000. And that's, that's really important, you know, if you're in an early stage. And they also happen to get $1.4 million for the Army, um, which is even better. But it's for a real right. project. But so, um, so uh, that's one of the things I've been interested in. And so, for example, you asked why I was here. So I was specifically here for a meeting with the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, hmm. and uh, who's, who... Uh, and I'd never met him. And, and when I was maritime. Honestly, it sounds like something out of Anna Karenina. I was there meeting the <laughs> Commandant of the Coast Guard. Well, you know, every time I do this, I, you know, when I became Maritime Commissioner, I, I knew virtually nothing about it. I knew a lot about regulation, but not much about, and, you know, so, somewhat typical political appointee. I, I knew a lot about something, but not necessarily about that specific agency. And partly that's why I was put in it. But, um, the uh, and uh, uh, I was um, contacted by a guy I didn't know who was uh, 20 years younger than I, 15 years younger than I was, who had who had gone to the Yale Management School uh, 10 or 15 years behind me, as I had, and he was a a uh, Coast Guard lieutenant commander who was going to retire in six months, and he and I uh, he we talked, and then I out of the blue called the commandant of the Coast Guard, a guy named. Uh, Bill Yost, and uh, I said, could he come work for me as my special assistant in his last six months? And the commandant did, this guy, uh, what I've always found is the U.S. Coast Guard. And, and, you know, we talk about the swamp and all these kinds of things in the deep state. These are very competent people, and I'm reminded of that every time I meet them. And they don't have, politics doesn't govern them. Uh, well, politics can govern what they do, but th they personally don't, aren't governed by politics. Um, and he assigned them to me, and he really kind of taught me uh, all of the non-book stuff about the maritime industry. And, and you know, um, again, this is sort of an example of the way politics in the swamp works. Um, so I was nominated. Uh, I sat uh, at the Department of Transportation. I had a, I think I was given a consultant salary, which was not a whole lot, but um, for six months, and um, while I waited to be confirmed, and in that time frame, and this I, is what year? This would have been 1990, 89. Um, in the fall, I was uh, nominated in the late fall of 89, and then uh, I had run the the uh, transition operation for the administration, the new Bush administration for that agency, and um, but my point is, while you're in these waiting you get approached by all of the lobbyists <laughs> for all, yeah. the, you know, all of the interests that you govern. And, and I, uh, I had you know, talked to and received lobbyists from the maritime labor unions and the big shipping companies and the ship owners and operators and all that. And then out of the blue one day, I uh, got a call from uh, a guy representing, uh, I think it was Nike, um, and one of the two big shoe companies. And he said, you know, it's not just about ships and sailors. It's also about the customers. And, uh, and he brought in a guy from DuPont, uh, which sounds like you know, one of these big super duper chemical companies, which of course it is and was, but um, they were the people who goods moved on the ships and they, their story was 180 degrees different than the story of the ship owners and operators and the shipyards and the maritime labor unions. And it was, it just reminded me, and that became, when I became commissioner, that um, shipping and all transportation really exists to benefit the customer, mm -hmm. the, the American uh, um, industrial customer or whatever. And, uh, you know, something like 90, 
98% of all of the goods consumed from overseas, which is about bigger than a quarter of our economy, comes on ships. So, so it was a good thing. And so, right. it, it, and, and, uh, so they had done that. And then, of course, I finally get my hearing, which I told you about that in one of the episodes, and got confirmed. And um, actually, just as a reminder, I, I went to the hearing. Senator Bro was from Louisiana, was in charge. And, um, and he asked this one question over different, 15 different ways, and I couldn't figure out what he wanted. And finally, I said, um, uh, uh, Senator Bro, um, we're going we're gonna to make sure it's fair, free trade. And that was that. You know, <laughs> and and, um, and and he said, "That's what I want to hear, Mr. Quartel. We'll have you, we'll have you confirmed tomorrow." <laughs> and I was, and um, and uh, Elaine Chow, who is now Secretary of Transportation, who I had who had served there as chairman a while back, she um, she swore me in at the White House, and all that it was a great time. But um, um, so Bill Zach, who was the uh, Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander, came on board, and he. You know, it was very similar to the story from the consumer side. It was it was about how these things actually operated, and and uh, I told the the guy today that story. And as it turns out, small world, he had been one of his instructors at the uh, Coast Guard Academy. And they and, always know each other. That's all. Oh, they do. Well, <laughs> it's a small the, service. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and uh, I'm just I, talking about the swamp. You always you mention a name. You're like, oh yeah, that was my supervisor back. <laughs> that's then. right. Yeah. That's right. Well, but it, you know, the, and the Coast Guard is small, and it's uh, it's very highly professional, and uh, you know, they really they are. And I don't want to name any names. You know, uh, this guy. His conversations are confidential, of course. But uh, and he had a, a terrific and interesting role, and we had uh, lunch at the the mess, and really nice. And uh, but. I'm, I'm always reminded of these are the people who toil behind the scenes and, and they probably have more contact with the American public than any other agency of the United States government mm -hmm. um, with the possible exception of the uh, Department of Agriculture and the field extension services and stuff. But, um, you know, there, I don't know how many millions of voters there are, but the Coast Guard's all out there doing that. But, you know, they're also, they're, they're involved in intelligence collection and uh, up in the Arctic Circle and all around and on the oceans and wherever we have wars, they are there on the front line um, uh, in the harbor stuff. And, and so uh, they're just a, a very, very competent group of people. And they do this with uh, a lot of diligence. So that's, that was the main reason I was here. And then, of course, once I'm here, I have make sure I have a bunch of meetings. And uh, <laughs> as it turns out, my wife, uh, one of her boards is... Uh, is uh, up here, and then she is going to be flying to Nashville tomorrow for uh, a, a conference with them, and I'm going to play the uh, tag-along spouse and follow <laughs> behind her about by about a day, uh, so I miss the really boring stuff. And, <laughs> but, and get, but you still get the hot chicken. So. <laughs> yeah, right. I get. The, I don't know if we're going to have hot chicken. We are going to go to the Grand Old Opry, so so I, I might have. I don't have a particular restaurant recommendation necessarily today, but when I see you next time, I'll have a a grand old Opry story and uh, some recommendations from Nashville because Very I've already good. made some, re some uh, reservations. So, so that's why, you know, and of course I'm typically will meet with um, the, my, uh, the, the, my new CEO and someone, one of my friends has characterized me as having fired myself um, <laughs> and brought in new CEO. So I'm not really retired. I, I spent some time with that and I'm having a dinner with uh, tonight with um, the, the chairman of another company on the board of which I sit. And uh, tomorrow I have uh, uh, a lunch with a couple people and a bunch of phone calls, and some of which are related to this new idea of the maritime and uh, some in related to agricultural technology. So it's, it's pretty busy. And I'm yeah. going to get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're, you're getting a little bit uh, <laughs> yeah, you're shaggy, for, right? Well, I'm, I'm kind of, I hate to say it, but I'm afraid to get a haircut down where I live. You know, I, I you know, put a bowl <laughs> in my head, you know. <laughs> yeah, you like you're about to throw your medals over the yeah right <laughs> yeah right um, so so uh, here we are in the swamp and they're you know they're having hearings not even a mile away from me you know so it is it is funny that, to hear you kind of talk about some of these guys because i have been struck it, it, the the great thing about hearings and, and and kind of the impeachment process and the russian stuff and all that 
you get to see people like William Taylor, the ambassador to Ukraine, or um, the, the former Ukrainian ambassador, uh, she testified, or some of these career politicians, George Kent, with the bow tie and the, the great bottle of water, the blue bottle of water that I, that I myself constantly have at my hand and right. <laughs> since they're making fun of him for. But you, you do get a sense when you see some of these people that, and I always kind of tell people this, just based on my own experience here in local politics, I think libertarians especially, but just people in general, especially those who kind of have a diet of like Fox News or MSNBC or TV information. Yeah, you mean the impeachment channels? Yeah, right. <laughs> the entertainment yeah. channels, essentially. When people work in government, they, they aren't necessarily um, – the caricature that they're often made out to be a lot of times, like somebody said today, Oh, well, Mueller was a Republican and um, uh, for the, who, the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein was a, was a Republican. I go, yeah, these guys may have been registered Republicans, but they're not Republicans. Most people who work in the bureaucracy of a government or work in a governmental system at local state or federal levels, they're usually nonpartisan. They, well, they, they, yeah. Yeah, they're usually just kind of, they're not like your typical Republican that you'd see on Facebook or out walking and canvassing neighborhoods. They're different. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's, um, you know, you and I started to talk about it. It's, uh, you know, I was just in Santa Fe for four or five days uh, a couple weeks ago. And, and I was in Houston for board meetings for four days after that. And, and um, just to lay down a baseline here is I, I actually don't think most of the people I was around actually gave much of two, two cents worth about any of this. They, they were, you know, aware of it. They, these are all very smart people. I'm sure they had an opinion. Uh, I'm sure their opinion was largely based on how they voted in, in uh, the last presidential election. Um, because, you know, if you look at the polling data, it's starting to, it's sorting itself that way. Yeah. The, you know, it's the, the same percentage of people, plus or minus one, who voted for Hillary Clinton, uh, favor his impeachment now and removal, and the same percentage of people who voted for Trump, plus or minus one or two, um, oppose it. And so uh, I think that's certainly the way it is in the middle of the country and where you are. I, I suspect it's very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. It's a really good, uh, if you watch it, it's a, a good... Um, it's, it's a good representation of people who do work in the government. So, for example, uh, uh, Yank, what's the, the, the former ambassador who was with Yanukovych? Uh, Yanukovych, yeah. Um, I, I will say I'm not, not as sympathetic, um, you, know, you know, where I stand on uh, Trump, and, and I, there's no question what well, for our, new, for our new listeners, go ahead and articulate that just a little bit. <laughs> Well, I didn't vote for him, and I didn't vote for Hillary. I voted for Mick Mullen. I'm happy to say that, and I can't imagine voting. You know, I'm a lifelong Republican. I've never voted for Democrat, uh, but there are just a lot of Republicans I don't vote for, um, and, and on a variety of things. Uh, and, and so I think of myself as a traditional, uh, true Burkean conservative. So I think government institutions are really important. Um, I think the, that... Uh, they do have to change. Um, it needs to be evolutionary unless you have some something big that needs being revolutionary. Um, so, uh, and I think, uh, you know, I, I certainly personally prefer to stay out of other people's business and uh, lots of different variations of that. So, um, so I'm not fond of, of the guys that are in there right now. But um, so my point about that though is, is, so, so Yanukovych um, was certainly a career diplomat. She has quite a long history. Um, I don't know whether she is good, bad, or indifferent, to be perfectly honest. I do think that what you see is, is the State Department, um, the, the official, uh, the, the State Department professionals uh, rallying around her by and large. And I think they would have done that around virtually anyone. Um, I thought it was interesting. We went for two days virtually of hearings and it was all about how terrible it was the president fired her for this reason or that reason and he was doing this and of course they're, they're talking about maneuvering her out of the way so he could do something else 
that I think that's the narrative they're talking about. But the reality is, she pointed out, the, pres- the, the ambassador serves at the pleasure of the president. He, he can fire for a reason or for no reason whatsoever. And, um, and it's, it doesn't matter whether it's a good reason or a bad reason or a legitimate reason or not. So, so at the core of that, and, and again, remember- Let, Let's I'm put a, it this way. John Adams was recalled by Washington. I think it was Washington for just being, uh, or the Continental Congress, excuse right. me. Just for being a little difficult, and Franklin didn't yeah, really like him all that. Right. You know, you, well, and you that's right. That Amsterdam. Well, and the notion that um, that ambassadors are fully informed all the time is also not true. Um, they're supposed to be. You know, foreign governments look at our, our ambassadors as being the representative of the president of the United States as much as the country. So it's that's why it's at the pleasure of the president. So. Isn't it just um, a patronage system at this point, really? No, it's not. No, 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 no. There, it, it is patronage at one level, um, and I, I want to qualify that. It's, it's not necessarily bad or good either. You know, you, what you get, I think it's probably roughly 80% of all of the ambassador jobs today. It used to be 100%. Today, it's about 80% are from the professional ranks, people who work their way from the bottom to the top. So they're very skilled and they, you know, uh, some of the best people I know have been professional from the State Department. Um, you know, my company has, we, I have a company that operates in Jordan and Iraq and met in that time uh, uh, an ambassador there who just, he's spectacular. And he, he was in, in Jordan and then he was uh, assigned to Iraq. He did a great job there, not only representing the country, but as a private company, he was immensely um, helpful and articulate to the government, and he he was that way for everyone. And then um, and then he uh, and then he uh, finally retired, and he went into the private sector, and he's done extremely well. He he's the kind of person who you know you are so glad he had a full career in in the government, and then he went on to make some money somewhere. But um, so these guys, so that's the kind of guy who sits in about. 80% of the jobs and he's, you know, you want people who can speak the language and understand the culture and have a full understanding of the socio-military demographic, everything else about these countries. Um, and then, and yes, you're right. There's some percentage, which are pure patronage. They are typically people who've given a lot of money or their friends or whatever. Well, they're in the big posts. They're in Paris and they're in London and they're in uh, probably, I don't know, Italy probably. Uh, and the Bahamas, which, by the way, is really important because that's a big drug trafficking area. Hmm. And, and uh, so, um, and of course, they rely on this, this whole architecture of you, what you would call the deep state if you're a negativist or the swamp or whatever, or, or you could call them the professional cadres. And um, so, uh, and, and typically in places like London and and uh, Paris, they point very, very wealthy people because these are very, very expensive posts, and and frequently they're expected to reach into their own pockets, and and uh, and redecorate and fix up these cre- decrepit old embassies, and then throw big parties, and it comes out of their pocket. Okay, and so it, like a guy like Sondland, who was um, who is or wasn't he, he was a patronage guy. Right, he was a guy who had given millions to Trump, and then he was right. made ambassador to the EU. So the, a guy like that is picked because he's rich to go pick fix up the house, so the government doesn't have to pay for it. Um, potentially, okay, that's <laughs> yes. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, think about this: NATO is really important. It's yeah. uh, um, uh, typically it would be somebody who probably knew the president better. Um, and um, I, I don't get the sense that Sondland knew uh, Trump all that well before all this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I have certainly known ambassadors in NATO who knew the president. They served really well. And, um, but on the other hand, for something like NATO, you want somebody there who um, is intelligent, has been successful in other uh, walks of life, uh, is capable of dealing with other people, um, as senior leaders and all that, and who the president in whom the president has, you know, full faith in what they do. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that he was a political appointee. Now you can gauge each one separately by how well they do. And um, uh, so a lot, so I, so to me, a lot of the conversation going on around these guys 
and women is it's it's fluff and it's really kind of irrelevant. It's irrelevant that he was a political appointee, but they sort of make a big deal out of that. It's irrelevant um, um, that Yanukovych was fired um, uh, because the president can fire anybody any anytime for any reason. Um, what's going on is you're seeing them build a narrative, and I, yeah. I uh, uh, that uh, the president was maneuvering uh, to remove her so he could get somebody else in um, who would do his bidding and and blah blah blah. And that may well be the case. Yeah, to to give people some cliff notes, she was essentially. Rudy Giuliani was working in the country at the time because Trump has a lot of theories that Ukraine was more important in uh, helping Hillary and, and trying to right. hurt him. Well, it and, was specifically around the supposed computer, remember? Yeah, the, the, the server, the server. The CrowdStrike server. And so he wants, he thinks that there's a gold mine of information in the Ukraine, essentially, that if he can get the right investigations in the Ukraine, it will vindicate him and it will basically exonerate him too. And so he had Rudy Giuliani working in Ukraine and Rudy through his security work basically found some of what the, what I would say the second, the, the state department, the permanents we'll call them instead of the deep state. They, they were on the opposite side of the people that Giuliani were talking to because they were giving Giuliani a lot of bad information who was funneling it back to Trump, giving him a lot of bad information and then on the other side, you had Yanukovych and the uh, permanent class of ambassadors and State Department folks there going, no, that's not the way this works. We're trying to right. move corruption. And so he fired her because he wanted her to stop being a roadblock to what he wanted. He, he brings in William Taylor, who isn't the official ambassador currently because nobody has apparently <laughs> can, can get confirmed in the right. Trump administration. They can't staff properly. And so, you know, then he starts, so he has um, Sondland, Trump has Sondland kind of working with Rudy in some aspects, uh, along with Rick Perry, the energy secretary, who's trying to sell natural gas. You have um, several other players you have, and, and Taylor just kind of goes, something's not right here. Things are not adding up. I don't understand what Giuliani's doing. There's different channels of communication. Right. And so... You know, now you have all these people coming out and testifying as to their their sense that things were wrong. But the problem, in my mind, and I'll, I'll ask you kind of what your feeling is, I, I certainly understand the issue and possibly impeachable offense of a president circumnavigating his own employees, essentially, for political purposes to try and dig up dirt on future political opponents and withholding congressionally mandated funds for those purposes. I have a real problem with that. But I also have to look at this and go, all right, with Nixon, you had Butterfield and the tapes and him ordering on, you know, in, in, with several people in the room to destroy tapes. You had the blue dress with Clinton that was the the concrete right. evidence. The problem with a lot well, of- and also, and also the lie to the-, to the uh, You had him on tape lying, you know? And so- right. With with this situation, if you're going to push impeachment, there seems to be nothing here that puts you in the Oval Office with the president saying, I want you to do this. Sondland may be the only person, and, and he may be looking at Michael Cohn and some of these other people and going, I'm not going to be his patsy. I'm not going to jail. I'm going to tell the truth. And But still, even then... Um, uh, but, but I'm going to... I think it's worth reeling back some of this, too, because, um, again, it, all that you've outlined is actually a really good example of how Washington and the swamp, and, or whatever you want to call it, actually works. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the thing that I am always struck by is how everyone is just so shocked. Shocked. I am just shocked. You mean there's gambling president. Going Yes, that a president would compartmentalize what he does. I'm shocked that a president would have a, a secret private ambassador. I am just shocked that the president might do politics. You know, I, 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 I have little sympathy for Mulvaney, Mick Mulvaney, the acting chief of staff, when he said, get over it. You know, they, people do it. Politics is in, polit in uh, foreign policy. And I have no idea whether he meant get over you know, what Trump did or just politics in general. But the reality is, the reality is that presidents do sidestep their own bureaucracy. They do do things uh, in secret, which, you know, some may or may not be uh, 
what you would want to think presidents do, but they do. Hopefully, it doesn't. Especially escape. in areas of foreign policy where you don't want other, other countries don't want. Totally. Them. Yeah. Totally. And and uh, of course, <clears throat> what we forget, and this is you know over the years the campaign finance laws have become very delicate around this stuff. What we forget is the president uh, is both the political figure and the chief executive, and he lives in and works in his house. Uh, so it's almost impossible for a president to separate politics from his day-to-day -day existence. And, um, and, and, and every decision has some political angle. Uh, and politics is not a dirty word. We've come to believe it is, but it's not. It's, it's about a political process of people trying to work through different points of view. And, uh, and everybody, everybody comes to everything with some point of view. Uh, uh, once they have, uh, they come in frequently with a point of view and then they may learn something that changes it, but people do come in with a philosophical or ideological point of view. And so uh, yeah, I find it uh, amusing and um, that, you know, now we have the, the political class and, the, and the, the, the media and all those, as I say, being just shocked that a president would have somebody like Giuliani go over. Now, was Giuliani acting on his own? Who knows? Um, it'll, I'm sure it'll come out. And, uh, and a lot of times people uh, interpret what they want to interpret. If you, you may remember, uh, uh, who will rid me of this damn priest uh, <laughs> in, in uh, history? And, and that may be some of what's going on. And of course, that's how you get in trouble, too. Um, and, you know, Trump is, is uh, unusually uh, out of, uh, not in control of his own government. And part of that is because he has an unusual number of open slots and vacancies across in the political class, which you need to be able to control government. And he's generally a war with his own government. <laughs> yeah, it's because he doesn't have his own people. He hadn't, put, he hadn't nominated people to do it. So, right. Um, and I'm sure we can get the numbers for the next show because that's an interesting topic in and of itself. You know, well, the way I think that's an important point for libertarians to understand. Gary Johnson wins the presidency, and the next day, you're filled. Your your government is staffed with what? All of the Cato Institute, three or, or four thousand people. Yeah. All right. What do you do with the what the, the do you do with the other thirty eight hundred people? So yeah. Um, yeah. So it's. Um, but anyway, so you you know I th so for me I look at all this and I I think well. Who knows? It may be impeachable, but the problem is there's not a lot of credibility on either side. I, I think the Democratic problem is that they have, as has been pointed out, there have been people calling for uh, Trump's impeachment since the election. Um, I do think there are the uh, there's a set of people who has never accepted the outcome of the election. I don't like the outcome. I wouldn't have liked either way, but right. you know, it's it, it it was the election and it was legitimate, and he got elected. Um, their excuses, I think people have not figured out that um, Hillary Clinton lost because she lost the election. Um, and yes, the Russians interfered and blah, blah, blah. And you have the social media and you have all of the, um, the, the crazies in there. And I, you know, I have a friend who was one of those crazies and sending out disinformation. So and on the other side, you have people who didn't expect to win and, um, and they've sort of never been credit for winning. So it's been a battle from day one. So that's really what you're seeing, I think, in, in a lot of ways. So I think the problem with this particular instance is that it's, I, I, my personal opinion is that, and I think the opinion of a lot of people, if you really push them, is it's, 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 um, it, it's bad. Um, uh, I do think that uh, Trump went into the presidency with a very negative view of the Ukraine. The Ukrainian government has been corrupt uh, for quite a while. Um, the Obama administration viewed it as corrupt. Um, uh, I, I think anybody standing back would agree that the fact that Hunter Biden uh, accepted uh, the, the uh, uh, a board seat of a company that was under investigation that paid him 50 to 80. I've seen $84,000 a month. Um, you know, that is a fortune 500 in the United States will pay you three to $400,000 um, for a board year? seat, 500,000 for board seat. Yes. This was not a fortune 500 company. It was a Ukrainian gas company. <laughs> 
And so they were paying him $600,000 plus a year. Um, when his father was over there, he went with him in the airplane uh, to the Ukraine. He, he hitched a ride. Uh, I'm sure Biden paid for his son's flight. That, you know, I'm sure he covered all those bases. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, so anyone objectively would question the intelligence of his doing it. You know, yeah. was that legal or illegal? I doubt it was any of those things. But was it intelligent? No, it was pretty, pretty damn stupid on, on Hunter Biden's part. And I honestly, I'm sorry, I don't really believe that somebody in Biden's staff didn't know what was going on. If they didn't tell Biden and he wasn't aware, that's massive incompetence. So I was just but watching. So, I was just watching the show about the the royal family and and oh Prince, yeah with Prince, Prince Edward. Andrew yeah yeah yeah, well, yeah Edward well, right. Well, Prince Edward was in the movie industry and was trying to get a career going in, in creating films. And he once you realized everybody was only asking him to join their project because he was his royal highness. Right. And not because of his particular gifts. He got he got frustrated and just quit the industry. You know, it, it's you you have a person who has that kind of stature because you think it might get you some influence, whether whether Burisma knew or did not know. Of course, they uh, knew. If, you know, Hunter Biden, th their intention, I believe, was to put him on the board because they think they could funnel information back to the vice president because they think that our government works like their government, which right. is working. Yes, working that's really to true. Yes. Right. Yes. So the their intentions were to totally whether you can't prove that Hunter Biden didn't pick up the phone or did pick up the phone and and talk to his dad and then and all that kind of stuff but there was definitely an intent on Burisma's part to have Hunter Biden in this position because he was Hunter Biden well and and the point you one of the points you're making is that other governments think we are like them right and and I I have to say that uh the fact of uh the, the Trump administration uh, Trump's daughter and son-in-law and all these other people being engaged in the government I I understand why someone who was young and intelligent and from New York and all that would want to be, um, and and I don't I don't question their desire for for uh, to, to serve the country, um, but it is it, you know it's questionable as to whether they should do it for all sorts of different kinds of reasons the way it looks. But so I don't believe that Hunter Biden should have been his excuse necessarily, but they are the media is sort of flipping past this. And of course, the right wing is making it all about Hunter Biden, and the left wing is making it all about Trump and the phone call and uh, Hunter Biden. <laughs> and um, you know what? All of this lacks is is a Sam Irvin, or or uh, uh, you know a, 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 a Baker, uh, you know Senator Baker from Tennessee. And the two of them, if you go back to Watergate. Um, they were kind of a, a great duo, Sam Irvin, you know, they had the Senate hearings first, remember, and then they, yeah. they sent their investigation, uh, Watergate investigation over to the House, if I recall, uh, which was drafting articles and, and, uh, and it was so clear that um, Nixon resigned. So Nixon was never impeached. Uh, and um, the only person who, who's been impeached besides Andrew Johnson was Bill Clinton. And, um, uh, in normal circumstances, there are plenty of things that the Senate and the House could have done, which might have been more appropriate and which for which they would have, in my opinion, received more support. Um, and they could have they could have censured him. And, you know, several presidents have been censured for one thing or another. I suspect that a lot of Republicans who were so ticked off about um, and horrified by this and ticked off by um the Syrian action and other things would have voted for censure. So they, I suspect they would have had a pretty good vote on that. Oh yeah. You remember Syria? I forgot about oh, that. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Remember, remember all that? Yeah. Helsinki, I forgot yeah, all about right. Yeah. Right. So, but this but, is, but, uh, that's so, my, but, but not to but, catch you know, up, but to my point is it, 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 they shot themselves in the foot because the Democrats since day one have been trying to impeach this guy. And it's like, you just they found an excuse. Right. If you yeah. just kept your powder dry, independents like yourself and I would be a little more like, all right, yeah, but you've been trying to do this all along. Yes. So it, 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 it's probably impeachable. He probably did it. They'll probably be able to build that story. But I think there's a question as to whether they're credible impeachers, right. um, you know, because they lost their credibility when they started calling for impeachment back at the beginning. And um, and there is a thread of legitimacy to the issue of, um, of uh, 
uh, of corruption in the Ukraine. There's a, some threat of legitimacy in the um, the Hunter Biden thing, and uh, of course, yeah. I, but I do think you know if we reel this back to this issue of um, of uh, we should look at history, and this is you know these people. Um, uh, sh- uh, ship these guys do not have any of the physical you know they don't have the physical presence and they certainly don't have the detachment that howard baker and sam Irvin exhibited and that committee exhibited uh way back during watergate and and they were kind of peeling back facts layers of facts yeah you've got um, barry goldwater going over to the white house the night the, the the day before the president resigned going hey they got you you're screwed you don't have to yeah. like you guys you know adam schiff is playing this role of i don't know who uh the leaker is i i'm i'm just waiting to see the well outcome. and of course he, he the, leak, the leaker you know got to him first I, of course right. what i'm surprised about and and i completely support the fact that the leaker you know the law protects him they they shouldn't yeah. be going after him but the other side of that if i were the trump people what i'd be do, saying is look under the constitution you have a right to be confronted by your accuser and and so all these other people are essentially building evidence so they're the they're the witnesses but they are right. not the accuser and although I guess Schiff would say that he's the accuser, but you know, so so today, for example, so but the, that the, my point was this past weekend he's in California after a week of going I'm just above all this. He's at a Democratic rally going we're gonna get the guy, you know, like he, it yeah. is fairly uh, insane that you don't. I don't think the public trusts Schiff or Pelosi or or any of these. Fo- much to your point about Irvin and uh, Baker. Yeah. But, so. But, but, you know, but, uh, you know, so, so the name of this show is Explaining the Swamp, right? So we're, and so we're talking about um, sort of how it wa- works. And, um, and um, w- when you look at the parade of witnesses, you really do see quite an array of people. So you s- saw uh, the uh, ambassador first, and she get, did a credible job. But, of course, shift, you know, when he, he says, well, you know, the president's tweeting against you right here. Well, how do you feel? Well, of course, she was going to say, well, I feel intimidated. And um, so it's, it's, a set, it's a set play, you know. And, um, but you, you've seen sort of minor people. You, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting that one of several of Pence's staff who were involved. Um, um, and, of course, Trump's MO is to attack everybody. Um, and I, it'd be interesting to know how Pence is dealing with this. I'm sure he knew knows the young woman and uh i'm i'm sure that uh, uh she is perfectly competent uh, and then you have uh volker you know former ambassador saying that he uh, he should have recognized that as an attempt to uh to uh, for politics but he didn't and now he does and you know people are amending their testimony uh, but so you have but you do have an array of people who are competent and uh, and represent kind of the full raft of political appointees and National Security Council professionals. And of course, I don't have known many, many people at the NSC and, and they're typically smart, intelligent, well-educated, apolitical. Most of them serve through several different um, political, uh, you know, presidencies. Um, and it's the same thing as State Department. Um, now, if you're on the other side of this and you, you say, well, the, the, the deep state is out there and they're undermining me, which is what Trump is now saying, um, you know, you sort of have an argument, too, because the deep state kind of runs on, um, on a set of rules and things that we have been decided for a long time. And, um, and it takes something uh, extraordinary, typically a politician, to disrupt it. So let me give you two examples of uh, foreign policy things that have been supported by uh, the establishment, the deep state, etc., that have totally uh, discombobulated a lot of people in the State Department and the foreign policy establishment. One, and the both around Israel, one of which was Trump's decision to, uh, to uh, move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to um, Jerusalem uh, and recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, that has been um, that has been official U.S. policy and, for, and U.N. policy for 
30 some 40 you know years and right. every year the government certifies or something i can't remember what the exact process is there that no we're not going to do it this year we're not going to do it this year we don't want to destroy the karma in the middle east and the talks are going on and it's stable and wide you know and uh, so all of a sudden trump does it and makes bb netanyahu really happy and hoping to influence the election and of course netanyahu did not win um didn't lose but he didn't win and um so that but that utterly discombobulated the state department and and the foreign policy establishment um, it made chuck schumer happy because he has a large constituency that is um, excited about that we have another one of those actions this week where um for decades um it has been official u.s policy and united nations policy that the Jewish settlements and incursions into the Palestinian territory that the uh, Israelis conquered however many decades ago, that those are illegal and against international law. So we have the scene two days ago or yesterday of Mike Pompeo, Secretary of the State, declaring all of a sudden that they are not illegal and it is not inconsistent with international law, even though everybody else thinks it's inconsistent. And of course you have a set of people, all the State Department people and everybody else waving their hands and going crazy and the whole foreign policy establishment around the world saying, it's going to destroy the you know, peace in the Middle East. Well, we don't have peace in the Middle East. We just have sort of detente in the Middle East. And um, uh, you know, part of me thinks that this is, this, is the, this is the sad part of the Trump administration. They came in to be disruptors and, you know, in the technology world, what you want to be is disrupt an industry. You know, think about um, Amazon, which first disrupted books and then disrupted deliveries and, and now is disrupting, um, you know, with the, uh, their, uh, the cloud and all these things and other companies that have disrupted um, the way people do business. And over time, we generally think that's a good thing. Certainly anybody in my line of work and, um, and I, I think that's probably a good thing in foreign policy and, uh, you know, various kinds of government things. And, um, but because of the way they go about it, uh, they, they sort of lose the importance of it uh, and they lose the benefit they would get from doing it. it. It feels as if it's not part of a well thought through policy. And, you know, everybody in the, deep state and all this they like to think they have sort of a policy path that they've thought through what they're doing and then they decide and then they just they do it and they the problem is they do it over and over and over and over and over again and um and it becomes a status quo so this is this is the kind of the tragedy of these people in, in this administration they really they had some opportunity to both disrupt take a lot of things off the table that and uh, and I think they've lost all of the the, the value of some of what they've yeah done. they're they're going to be completely obsessed. I think I think to put a kind of a bow on what you're saying, and it's something that I've thought a lot about. It, it is confusing for your average person. All of this is very confusing because you have reasonable arguments from both sides. You have on the establishment side and the left. You have the argument that listen. This president is completely out of control. He's erratic. He's awful. And these are the safeguards in place to keep him hemmed in. And look, the system is working. And then yeah. on the right, you do have, I am not unsympathetic to the argument that, look, the deep state is after me. Look at Page and Strzok and look at Bruce right. Orr and look at the whistleblower being a former Biden staffer who works for the CIA. Like he's, he's not being named because he's the absolute worst possible whistleblower they could have hoped for because he just played <laughs> right into central casting yeah or trump as an opponent because he's just this weak little wimpy cia leftist guy like he's everything that trump has fought against i mean it so i think it becomes confusing for the average person because both of those have merit and they seem to make sense like you've got this a new anonymous book by the guy who wrote the guy or gal woman. called anonymous, right? <laughs> called anonymous who, you know, we're, we're the steady state. We're taking care of keeping Trump in line. And, and, and as somebody who wants a disruptor as somebody who wants to see significant changes in multiple policies across the federal government, 
it terrifies me that there are people out there who see it as their job to just ignore whatever the president says. I get that he's absolutely insane, but at the same time, it's your job, <laughs> right, to, to follow through on what the president says. And, and you had some of that with Nixon, too, where it's like Alexander Haig looking at everybody going, if that guy orders the codes, you can see this in the final days. By <laughs> right. Call me first before you launch the codes, okay? Right. Um, <laughs> Although um, the big difference between Nixon and Trump is that Nixon really understood government and the bureaucracy. Yes. And, uh, and he had uh, guys like Henry Kissinger around him who also understood it and had a strategic vision. I, I think there are not many visionaries uh, there today. I think it, this is very much like writing a script daily for uh, you know, a daily serial. This is almost like, to, to me, some of this resembles um, uh, a soap opera. Would you say reality TV, Rob? Oh, I would go beyond that. You know, reality TV is one thing. Reality TV happens once a week, right? This right. is a soap opera. This is like days of our lives. And, and you have new characters in every day and somebody's good one day and bad the next day. And they, one day they're alive and the next day they're dead. And then, oh, wait, <laughs> they're, they're not dead. They're, they were, they're a zombie or something else. But um, so, and I do think that um, I, it's been observed before. He really wants to stay in the news. And, um, you know, I, I've said it before, my bottom line on this is that this is not going to help the Democrats get him out of office. You know, first of all, there's, I don't think they're going to, there's enough here to warrant an actual uh, uh, removal, probably. I think there will be a number of, I doubt there will be enough senators who believe there's enough to warrant removal, and partly because of the obvious uh, politics involved in this and the history to, of the Democrats. To your, to your soap opera storyline idea, Richard Nixon is uh, embedded and he understands power, but he's, he's deeply corrupt. And for decades, we've all known this guy is corrupt. And then look, we've got evidence that he broke in. He had people break in so he could seal his reelection. He's everything we've been saying he was for the last 25 years. Right. Now we've got tapes. You know, yeah. you, you look at Clinton. Clinton is a serial philanderer, and he is trying to cover up his affair with a young intern, and he's lying about it, and then we caught him with the blue dress and the DNA matches. Like, those are very easy elevator pitches for the opposition. Right. This well, is very yeah. complicated, and they don't want to really clean it up and, and make it easy to understand because they're all complicit in doing a lot of the same thing. So I just don't think that in terms of – there there's not much there because there isn't that damning evidence there isn't that overarching storyline and it fits into the narrative of you've all been trying to get me since the beginning since day one and now look this is a fake witch hunt and right. i just think voters are going to go we have the opportunity to remedy this in 11 months why are you go you're just going to remove anybody that is a conservative that you don't like like the media can just run a f five year campaign to just get rid of the person that I voted for? Like, no, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to vote for the guy just because you're trying to get him. So I, well, I don't. And, and, and you don't realize, vote. of course, they're running into the counter narrative, which is, oh my God, this guy has done so much in such a short period of time. And, and I believe you believe me. I hear that all the time. I heard it from my brother and, and I, I said, yes, tell me. And he sends me a list, which he'd obviously copied from some website. Right. Bart, yeah. And, uh, and they, they I, yeah, and I, well, I don't think he reads Breitbart, but you know, he's actually, my, my brother's a very well-informed guy. He, oh. he, uh, he likes to put on country airs, you know, even though he's, <laughs> he's not. And, um, but I, but I, I, I hear it all the time. And I, I, I heard it again on TV this morning. I was watching one of the networks. And it, so th this is going to keep going on. And, uh, and, and I think the, the problem here for the Democrats is they, they are running into the institutional issues, which is, you know, I have a calendar and um, the Senate's going to, um, um, uh, you know, adjourn at some point. And it's going to probably, no matter how fast, they're already passed behind on the House side. And no matter how fast they do it, they're going to end up uh, probably in January, right smack in the middle of the primaries for the Democrats. Um, you know, I will, I will not be surprised if the, they force the whistleblower, so-called whistleblower, to testify or he's outed somehow. Um, 
and of course they make a big deal around that. And then, um, so this is just gonna go on as it's, and it's a, it's a unfortunate. And, and by the way, uh, you know, virtually anything can be um, uh, um, impeachable. I just think a lot of people probably feel probably, well, half the public feels that it's, this may be bad. Now, some of them don't necessarily think it's bad, um, but is it worth all the rah-rah and hoorah that we have going on and all the waste of time and energy? And, um, and I think Nancy Pelosi is probably sitting there thinking, oh, you know, God, what have we done? And wishing she could have controlled them better. She knows the outcome. Uh, the outcome is gonna be against the Senate. They, if this is all they've got, it's not gonna be enough to change minds. Um, and the uh, Senate will not vote for it. And uh, then, you know, half of these people, Elizabeth Warren and the others will, and uh, Cory Booker and, and uh, Amy Klobuchar and, and uh, these others will be trying to uh, go back and vote and listen and they have to be on the floor. They, they're, they're the jury, they have to be there every day. And I don't believe that uh, uh, um, the, uh, McConnell is gonna give anyone any outs I think he's going to hold them there. And um, so the people out there will be Joe Biden and um, Mayor Pete and uh, uh, Tom, what's his name, the billionaire from California. And, Mayor. Yeah, right. And then uh, some of these, and then uh, Bloomberg and you know, <laughs> the crowd. And um, it's going to have a major impact on the Democratic primaries. And, hmm. I hadn't uh, thought about that. But that's, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's it's a brilliant TV show, and uh, I think uh, Trump's gonna win it. Unfortunately, right. I'm day. Of, I'm offended at what he did because should be. I care I mean, about. I care, yeah, it should be. Everybody should be. The, all right, I care about the Constitution, and I think he violated the Constitution, his constitutional authority. But I don't think most people could. I, I'm I'm a nerd. I'm weird. I don't think most people could. They could care less. So what? It's it's business, man. You you get something, they give something. Like, of course, quid pro quo. I'm all for it. So, so well, you notice. So there, there's been a lot of this in the media. So the Democrats have changed it from quid pro quo to right. bribery, which is a uh, which is a, a very explicit term. You know, that has a long history in English common law, and uh, it's very well defined. So, I think they're going to have a hard time. Uh, making the case that it's explicit bribery. Typically in bribery, you have to have uh, uh, an offer and an acceptance and then something for that. And um, it's not clear they're gonna be able to prove that. Um, and you're already seeing, you're seeing some cracks and differences in testimony uh, today and yesterday, and there'll, there'll be different versions and you're gonna have to try to sort it out and put it all together. But, but again, you know, um, I think people should not doubt uh, the competence and uh, serious intent and uh, the, and the uh, national service profile of all these people coming forward from whether they're political or whether they're professional uh, life uh, career, uh, State Department or an NSC or something else. They, these people are, uh, you know, you should you have to give them the professional benefit of the doubt. Um, I suspect the, uh, some people, as the one guy did today, said he didn't, he didn't view it as sort of out of the ordinary when he first heard it or heard about it. And now in light of all the rest, now he does. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Do, you know. we have, do we have time for uh, your dining guide to D.C.? Uh, you know, I, I haven't been – well, you know, I actually did. Where, I went to a, a really uh, – fun restaurant recently. I can't remember. I wish I'd thought about this beforehand, but, um, uh, but I'll, I'll remember it next time. Next time I'll tell you my dining guide to Nashville. Excellent. And when I see you and I'll, I'll remember this other restaurant, um, you know, I'm I, down here where I am in the Navy Yard. Uh, I've mentioned this before, you know, a couple of my absolute favorite restaurants are down here and uh, Chloe and, and uh, Schilling and uh, uh, Salt Line and, uh, all purpose and uh, pizza and uh, uh, Osteria Marini, fabulous Italian, uh, and uh, Anna at the District Winery. There's a, there's a winery down here on the waterfront, 
and uh, you know every day there are new restaurants there's a, a new mediterranean one coming and, and in general i would say if you've got uh, kids and uh, although winter is not quite so good but if you have young kids and, uh, or you just want to hang out on the waterfront this is the place to be in washington much more so than the wharf which I, I love the wharf, which is very modern, lots of, ho a couple big hotels there. So it's more touristy. This is where families hang out and, and the, uh, the builders in this area of town, and this is all new, you know, 10 years ago, there was nothing here, but, but um, big parking lots and all that. And today they have 35 or 40,000 new units of apartments and condos. And there's a, a big, uh, there's a hotel going in across the street from me here. Um, this is the kind of thing you would like to see in an urban environment that's sitting on a riverfront where they, they, they're seating and walkways and cool bridges. And so, so I, well, I, I just hope general next recommendation. Time, I just hope next time you can think of something. So <laughs> <laughs> come up with, some, okay. It's been great. Try, try well, we'll have more to yeah. talk about. We really need to do this within two weeks, Chris, because yeah. there will be so much more in two weeks. It, it'll be crazy. So, all right. Well, with that, we will say goodbye to Rob. I know he has dinner commitments. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone who listens. Uh, we sh should be on next week. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah. Rob, great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you soon. Yep. Thanks.